Um, the next speaker is uh, Taylor Perron. He's the Sisson and Ida Green Associate Professor of Geology, and he's an expert in the planetary geomorphology or the study of landscapes. And today, Taylor's topic is lessons from the landscapes of Earth and other planets. Taylor? Thank you, Rob, and good morning to everyone. As Rob just told you, I study landscapes. Not this kind. <laughs> Although they are very pleasant. I'm talking about this kind. In my group, we try to understand quantitatively the physical and chemical processes that shape the surface of Earth and other planets and moons. And our goal in doing this once we have that understanding, is to be able to read landscapes like this one, to be able to look into Earth's past, and to use our understanding of Earth's past to help us guide predictions of where landscapes might go and how they might change in the future. But we don't limit ourselves to Earth. We're also very interested in landscapes on other worlds. And the reason for that is that our other goal is to look in places that have very different conditions from what we are familiar with here. And the idea in doing that is that if we look on other worlds, we might be able to learn something about the landscapes on Earth that we would never be able to learn by looking at the landscapes on Earth. And I'm going to tell you about one example in particular that's really grabbed our attention, and that's Saturn's moon, Titan. In some ways, Titan is a strangely familiar place. It has a thick atmosphere that's made mostly of nitrogen, like ours, as Carrie Emanuel just told you. It has a similar atmospheric pressure to what we have on Earth. It's unusual among moons in the solar system in that it has a very thick atmosphere. It has a solid surface, weather, clouds, and rain. But in other ways, Titan is a very, very alien place. That solid surface is made of water ice. The clouds and rain are made of liquid natural gas, methane. And the reason it can exist as a liquid is that the temperature on the surface is about 300 degrees below zero Fahrenheit, which is cold even by Boston standards. <laughs> Although this past winter was distinctly more Titan-like, wasn't it? What's remarkable about Titan is that despite all of those differences, when we look at the landscapes on the surface, what we see is shockingly familiar. We didn't know much about Titan until very recently. There uh, is a problem in the atmosphere for observers in that Titan's atmosphere is a little bit like LA in the late 60s. It has quite a bit of smog because all of that methane in the atmosphere is broken apart by solar radiation and forms hexane and other hydrocarbons and even more complicated molecules that make the atmosphere opaque to just about all wavelengths, including the visible. So it's kind of an orange ball that we didn't know very much about until the Cassini spacecraft, which was launched in 1997 and arrived in late 2004, uh, showed us something about the surface. So what I'm going to show you here is an animation that was pieced together from images collected by the Huygens probe, which was a little spacecraft that was dropped on a parachute through that opaque atmosphere down to the surface. We knew so little about the surface that the bottom of the probe was made to float, just in case it landed in a lake. We're going from an altitude of about 25 kilometers down through that haze towards the place where the probe landed, and we're going to stop at an elevation of about 8 kilometers. And as you can start to see, and apologies for the grainy images here, but remember, this is a 1997 digital camera that's traveled through space for seven years, past harsh radiation environments. So before you criticize, tell me how your digital camera from 1997 is doing. <laughs> at any rate, what you see here as we've paused at about eight kilometers above the probe's landing site is a little mountain made of water ice that's being cut into by networks of rivers eroding the surface that flow down to what might be a dry lake bed. If you Photoshop in a blue sky and a brown or a green surface, you might be hard pressed to tell where you are. And that is what I mean by shockingly familiar. So 
it turns out that these river networks that I showed you are a very common feature on Titan's surface. As uh, MIT News called them in this feature they did, they are the moon rivers of Titan. And yes, it does appear that in some cases they are wider than a mile. <laughs> in the North Polar region, they flow into large hydrocarbon lakes, the size of the Great Lakes on Earth. In my group, we've been studying these features to try to learn something about the conditions on Titan. And we've learned some interesting things. What the probe saw when it settled all the way down to the surface, further than what I showed you a minute ago, was a surface covered with cobbles, boulders, and gravel, probably made of a mixture of water ice and organic goo. Not living organic goo, mind you. And we've been able to use that information coupled with the measurements we can make from images of the surface to calculate how hard it would have to rain to be able to move those cobbles and that gravel and to cut the rivers into the surface of Titan. And our calculations show that you need Earth-like rainfall rates to be able to do that. And so even though we can't actually see the rivers flowing directly, we can tell something about what the conditions are like on the surface. And again, strangely familiar. We've also been using computer simulations of the erosion of river networks into the surface to be able to judge something about how far the erosion into the surface has progressed. So what you see on the left here is a view of one of these simulations looking from above. The warmer colors are higher elevations. The cooler colors are lower elevations. And these dark blue regions are intended to emulate these hydrocarbon lakes like the ones around Titan's North Pole. And as I play this forward, what you're going to see is that very rapidly, this simulation surpasses the kind of development of river networks that we see on Titan. Now, we don't know exactly how long the ones there have taken to form, but what we've done with this kind of simulation and our analyses of that is that Titan's river networks and its landscape is, in some regions, in a very early stage of development. The rivers haven't cut very deep into the surface. That's kind of surprising, because Titan's been around for probably about as long as Earth has, billions of years. So why is it getting such a late or a recent start? Is it because the methane and the rain and the rivers are a relatively recent arrival? Something changed about Titan's climate in the recent past? Or is it because some process wiped the slate clean and renewed the surface and made all of the rivers start over again? We don't know, but we're working to try to figure that out. Now, why am I telling you about Titan when this is all about the future of planet Earth? The point I'm trying to make here is that we can see some features of landscapes on Earth and on other worlds that seem to be very robust. And one of those is river networks, one of the focuses of my group's research. If you rain on an erodible surface, sooner or later you will probably make rivers and they will cut into the surface to make ridges and valleys. And so this familiar landscape is familiar because it seems to be such a robust planetary feature, even in places where the conditions are very exotic. And that seems to be true of quite an array of different landforms. A few years ago, a colleague and I wrote a paper in which we asked if all we had was a topographic map of Earth, if all we knew was the shape of the landscape and nothing else, would we be able to tell that there's life here? Which, in the process of uh, the graphics department at Nature, became, is there life on this planet? Well, duh. <laughs> but, but the question is a serious one. Is there any landform that we see around us that can only develop in the presence of life? Well, I'll save you the agony of reading our paper and just give you the punchline. We couldn't think of very many examples. Let me try a couple out on you. What about meandering rivers? This is a feature that, in most cases on Earth, occurs when you have a lot of vegetation. And you get these long, single-thread channels that maintain an approximately constant width as they meander their way across the landscape because there's vegetation that has roots that holds the banks together. So surely, if you take that away, you won't get meandering rivers. Nope. We see those on Mars. So here's an example from within a crater of the remnants of an old meander bend and an old cutoff, sort of analogous to an oxbow lake on Earth. 
it looks a little bit strange because the rocks that formed from the sediments that were traveling through these channels ended up being harder to erode than all of the sediment around it. And so now you see the channels sticking out up above the rest of the landscape. But you can even see the time history of how this meander bend grew, if you look very closely here. We don't know what supplied the cohesion in the banks that held them together on Mars. It could have been some combination of ice or salt or maybe even a perfect cocktail of fine-grained mud that doesn't occur very frequently on Earth. But we know that it's not unique to Earth. Okay, so what about features like this? Look at these broad, rounded, soil-covered hill slopes in Northern California. We know that in many landscapes, the reason they're rounded like this is that things live in the soil, like Thamamis batai, the California pocket gopher. And by burrowing and stirring the soil, it gradually drives a movement down slope. And that creates a smoothing effect. It makes the slopes have this pillow-like shape. So surely if you take that away, you'll have sharp ridge lines of exposed bedrock, knife-like ridges. Well, we struck out on that one too, because we see smooth, rounded hill slopes on Mars too, in this case, image from one of the Murr rovers. Again, we don't know exactly what the process that transported all of the soil down slope was on Mars, but it was probably some combination of ice moving between the atmosphere and the ground, salt, and perhaps wind. Okay, I've just told you about all of the features of landscapes that seem to be pretty robust. So if we're interested in understanding how the environment around us might be sensitive to changes that might occur in the future, what about landscapes is not so robust? And I'm gonna give you a couple of examples. The first one I'll start with is a subtler point that I just made. The dominant form of rivers, even though river networks might be a very robust feature that can form in a wide range of conditions, the dominant form they take on appears to be quite sensitive to planetary conditions. And to understand this, we end up having to look into Earth's past. I'll preface this by telling you, or perhaps reminding you, that life on land is a relatively recent arrival here. Earth's about four and a half billion years old, and plants of the kind that we know on land with stems and roots and leaves have been around for less than a tenth of that. So what were the landscapes on the continents like before you had roots? The landscapes look something like this? Well, maybe. If we look elsewhere on Earth, where there are few or even no plants with roots, what do rivers look like? Now remember, I told you that vegetation plays a role in forming meanders. We know that's not totally unique, because I also told you they can form on Mars. But it seems to be a pretty rare case on Earth that you get a meandering channel like this one in the absence of vegetation. So what do we see elsewhere on Earth where you don't have that? Well, you see braided rivers. And this is a view actually taken by uh, astronauts on the space shuttle looking down at the Brahmaputra River in Tibet. And you see all of these little channels that shift, empty, and fill as the amount of water and sediment going through the river fluctuates. There's no vegetation, no roots to hold them together. So the river just does what it wants. Now, those who study the archives of sediments that record conditions deep in Earth's past have tried to put some numbers on this and ask, well, what did things look like 500 million years ago before we had vascular land plants? And here's one answer from a paper a couple of years ago. This is the percentage of river deposits preserved in rocks that corresponds to a given kind of channel that I'll mention in a minute. And this is the number of millions of years into the past. And if you start off around the time when we know there were no plants with roots, you see all different kinds of braided rivers, like the one we just looked at. And it's not until the arrival of those vascular land plants that you start to see remnants of meandering channels and a few other types that also maintain relatively fixed positions of their banks at any given time. So this is telling us that Although some elements of the landscapes around us, like the formation of river networks in general, are robust, the specific forms they take on and the distribution of those forms in time and space can vary dramatically. And so that's something that we need to pay attention to. 
Now, that's kind of an extreme example, life or no life. What about subtler sensitivities of landscapes, things that might change in the near future? Uh, hopefully, we don't go back to having no life. Well, I'll give you one last example that we're working on in my group to try to understand the sensitivity to an aspect of landscapes that might be influenced by what humans are doing now. And the story is about trees, rainfall, and landslides. Landslides most often are triggered after heavy rainfall. And that's because the water that percolates into the soil and the rock reduces the frictional resistance that holds the soil in place. One thing you can do to a landscape that will almost certainly increase the vulnerability of that landscape to landslides is to remove the roots. So in an example like this one in southwestern Washington state, where this slope has been clear cut, and a very, very heavy rainstorm came through a few years later, you can see the result. Now, we're trying to understand this process, not only in terms of the places where the vegetation has been removed, but also the places where it hasn't been disturbed yet. And here we're getting help from our colleagues in climate science. This is Paulo Gorman, who is one of our colleagues in Earth Atmospheric and Planetary Sciences. He's an atmospheric scientist who studies how extremes in rainfall change as the climate changes. And what Paul has shown is that under warmer temperatures, the largest storms that occur in landscapes in some regions will become more intense. The basic reason for this is when it gets warmer, the atmosphere can hold more water vapor at any given time. And so when that water vapor exits the atmosphere in the form of precipitation, it can be more intense. It doesn't happen the same way everywhere, and this is, these are the details of what Paul studies, but in some places, this is something that could have a significant impact on landscapes. And in our work together, we are developing models that quantify how landslides will respond to these changes in rainfall extremes that are estimated from climate models. And what we've found is that even if you have changes like those that are predicted, where the heaviest rainfall events get maybe 10 or 20 percent more intense, that you could have not only more landslides in a place like this, where they've already happened in the past, but more disturbingly, you may have areas that haven't been cut for a long time, or even ever, and that haven't experienced landslides for a long time, relatively suddenly become susceptible to landslides. And so there's a lot of bullets stored in this gun over here that uh, could be fired if the changes in rainfall uh, are as we think they might be. So we're working to try to understand this hazard and this change in hazards that might accompany changes that occur in our atmosphere in the very near future. So with that more recent example, I'm going to leave you with three thoughts that hopefully you've absorbed over the course of the last 20 minutes. The first is that if we look at planetary landscapes, we see some features that are shockingly familiar. And there appears to be a robustness in the development of these features, even under very exotic conditions, like branching river networks. But if you look at the specific forms that those river channels take on, or if you look at their distribution of those forms over time, then there can be dramatic variations and a greater sensitivity. And then finally, that sensitivity, which we also see in the occurrence of landslides, has been intertwined with life on Earth for a long time, and now it's becoming intertwined with human impacts. Thank you. Thanks so much, Taylor. Um, Taylor, in, in the process, also uh, highlighted one of the unique features of our departments. Um, in many departments uh, in the United States and all over the world, um, pro programs in climate science are separate from the study of, say, planetary surfaces and, and the solid Earth. And in our department, everything is together, and that leads to these wonderful uh, synergies between, say, the study that uh, uh, Taylor does on, on uh, landscapes and changes in landscape and the effects of precipitations and changes in climate. So that, that's wonderful.